that's fun. <laughs> that's unpredictable and fun. And it takes me on a journey as opposed to me forcing the painting on my journey. Hi, everybody, and welcome once again to Beyond the Palette. I'm your host, Whitney Rosenson, the owner and president of Art Dimensions, Inc., and I'm really looking forward to chatting with an awesome painter and photographer today, Lisa Gazzara. Lisa and I have been working together for many years. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Whitney. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Welcome to the Art Dimensions podcast. Thank you. It's so exciting. How long have you been painting and shooting? I was started drawing when I was four. My dad brought me home that huge crayon box, Crayola box with the sharpener in the back. Right, right. And I fell in love with midnight blue and fern green. Those are my two favorite colors when I was four so for some reason. My dad lent me his camera when I was 12 and I started shooting portraits of my family then. And uh, at the same time, I was get my parents really nicely got me painting lessons. So I started painting around 13. Awesome. Okay. And you don't have to say anything about your age today. I just... I'm very young. <laughs> <laughs> me too. So what motivates you? Color motivates me and beauty motivate me the most. My mom was is a very uh, tuned into beauty she used to constantly point out nature to me, the color of the sky, the color of the tulips, the line of trees. So she tuned me in at a very young age, probably in the stroller. I'm motivated by color and seeking beauty because I find the world can be a very complex place. And so I'm always seeking serenity through color and beauty. In nature, mostly. Yes. You have different bodies of work. Let's talk about the photography first. What different bodies of work do you have with the photography? My favorite series is the infrared series. And most of my work is black and white infrared, meaning when you photograph something using using a, a camera that's converted to infrared or film that is infrared, black and white, it captures an essence that we don't actually see. It makes it very mysterious and ethereal. And I never know what it's going to look like until I get back to the studio and download the photos and start adjusting them. That's so cool. Yeah, it's um, it's the closest I've come to painting with the camera. Right. Because when I paint, I don't know what's going to happen either. And so shooting with the infrared is really fun because I don't know what it's going to look like till I get it back to the studio. So it's a surprise for everybody. Yeah, it's fun. I know you're a very gestural painter. Tell me about your use of color and your bodies of work. Well, for a very long time, up until I graduated from college, I was a romantic, realistic landscape painter. And my favorite painter is George Innes from the Hudson River School. And he did beautiful, beautiful countryscapes with a touch of mystery. He didn't paint every leaf and every flower. So they were very... American impressionistic, but very rich. Black was his favorite color. He did a lot of shadows. For a very long time, I painted very realistically, somewhat realistically, but everybody knew they were landscapes. How does American impressionism or American realism differ from French? I should correct myself. It's actually called romantic realism. And I would say that it's almost the version of French Impressionism because it, it's based in beauty of landscape. But most American landscapes are much more dramatic than, say, the French landscapes. You know, you've got canyons, you've got rivers. I mean, it just seemed like America has much more drama to it. So the, the romantic realism of George Innes is very dramatic, yet very beautiful at the same time. Mm, okay. French Impressionists, I find to be m- much more based in soft pastel colors that are very, very delicate and beautiful. And then when, so when you first started painting, that's what you focused on? Yes. The beauty of landscape. I grew up in New England uh, with the four seasons and, and uh, we lived right next to the woods in a beautiful New England town. And I found a great deal of solace and peace in nature. So that's what I always tried to capture. 
And then when I graduated, probably right before I graduated, I got very frustrated and bored with replicating what already exists. And I was doing a painting that was annoying me. <laughs> and I had a big uh, coffee can of turpentine and mixed color, you know, cleaning my brushes in it. And it was bright orange. And I just took it and I threw it at the canvas. Oh, okay. And what wow. I heard was this really beautiful landscape line of a large hill. And then I went in and I subtracted and added and it became this autumn landscape. And that was like, that's fun. <laughs> that's unpredictable and fun. And it takes me on a journey as opposed to me forcing the painting on my journey. And so that was a gradual sort of shift. And then you're very gestural, like your Cosmos series now of recent um, is much more gestural. Yes. Well, what happened after I graduated from college is I traveled for a couple of years and saw, you know, the Grand Canyon, Colorado, Utah, Alaska. And I did a lot of photography at that time. I couldn't paint when I was traveling. But I then moved to Hollywood, to the Hollywood Hills. I was immersed in a completely opposite landscape from where I grew up, which is rolling hills and mountains very subtle mountains in New England to this very dramatic Beechwood Canyon. So I turned my my canvas vertical and I just started gesturally, instinctively throwing things down. And a lot of them ended up looking like Beechwood Canyon and palm trees, but very, very abstract. Oh, so I okay. followed that line and I distilled my palette down to black, white, and gray. And I painted that way for quite a while. Gradually got back into color. So to answer your question, um, the journey to abstract painting started in college is now I feel finally in a place that I really feel like it says what I wanted to say. Again, it starts with almost the same thing in the studio in college where I threw a bucket of paint. What I do now is I put a, a gel medium on canvas or wood or paper. So it's got a viscous, thick, sort of like a clear varnishy feeling to it. And then I take um, paint and I drop it all over it, different colors. And then the gesture has become, I use very long, thin sticks, like molding. And I just gesturally cover the entire painting with lines. Would you consider yourself to be an abstract expressionist? Yes, yes, for sure. My favorite painters are from that era, Joan Mitchell being my favorite painter. And Helen Frankenthaler and de Kooning and Pollock, all of them, I, I worship them <laughs> and the courage they had to do what they did at that time. So true. What do you credit your success as an artist to? It's funny. I, I don't know that I credit myself as being successful, but I credit myself as being very proficient and persistent. <laughs> right? I mean, I... Yeah, one lends itself to the other, hopefully. Yeah, I don't paint every single day because life is busy, but I always come back to it. So it's always been my primary form of meditation and breathing, really. Awesome. I'm asking this because I'm thinking about myself a little bit. What time of day do you find yourself most productive? Well, it's funny. I've structured my week so that Mondays and Tuesdays, I call them admin days. My Mondays and Tuesdays, I'm applying to contests or or exhibitions, taking care of my own business and my husband's business in terms of paperwork, bills. And then I have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, actually, actually Wednesday through Sunday to go into the studio. And I find that if I get in the studio at 10 a.m. after I've sort of woken up with a nice pot of tea, I can pretty much paint until four o'clock in the afternoon. Without any breaks? No, I definitely take a lunch break. And since I do such abstract pieces that start from an amazing amount of chaos, I do have to leave to not look at them for a while. I do come and go because sometimes if you continue to paint on something too long, you ruin it. And sometimes you don't know where to put the paint on. And so there are breaks. And oftentimes I'll read a book in the studio or a check out an artist I really like on the internet. I bring the computer down there. So interesting. So that you, so then you come back with a, like a different perspective or a fresh, fresh look. Yeah. I mean, Joan Mitchell, again, my favorite painter, abstract expressionist, she, um, I, as she painted the same way as I do in that she would paint for periods of time and then have to get really far away from it 
step very far away from the piece. Like physically? Physically to distance herself from the piece because we have a tendency to get in there and get detail-y. But if you, if you don't see that, the piece has to resonate from a large distance as well as a close distance. So small pieces and large pieces you do this with? Yeah, I mean, and when my studio was too small to get that far away from it, I would take my camera with a lens and unfocus. So I would look at the painting with it blurry so that I could get a, an overall feeling of the composition and design without I, when I didn't have 20 feet to go in back of me. And your studio now, I hope, has... I've, I have yet to see your new studio, but it has room for you to back yourself away from yeah. the paintings. And- yeah, it does. I, I'm, very, I'm very lucky. I've been able to sort of expand my original small studio uh, out into the, the environs of the garage that I paint in. I can get, definitely uh, get farther. And the beauty of that is I can paint bigger. My pieces are now 48 by 48 inches. The Cosmos? Si- yeah. That's so- four feet by four feet. It's a great size. Yeah. And then you also work small. You do work on paper. I do. I haven't in a while, but I do small gouache or watercolors on a little mm-hmm. watercolor block, which harken back to my love of landscape. Um, I'll paint a little small little landscape of the area that I'm living in and then go back to the abstraction in the studio. It's kind of it makes the brain work more. Yeah, you've got two different styles going on. Where can people see some of your work. What's your website? My website is my name. It's Gazara Arts. So that's G-I-Z-A-R-A arts.com. No, if you Google my name, a bunch of shows I've been in come up and certain um, interviews I've done like this. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> and obviously people can see your work on my site. Yes. The Art Dimension site. What has been your greatest challenge that you've had to overcome or obstacle that you've had to overcome? not having as much exposure and notoriety that I would like. Although I've been doing this for for very, for 30 years, I'm not in a group of artists that sort of feed feed each other's souls. You know, I would, I would love to have a group of uh, artists around me that we could go to each other's studios and help each other and prompt each other and support each other because the, the thing about being an artist, a, a creative artist, most creative arts is you're all you're always alone in your studio in your studio the the feedback you get if you're not in college or in a artist retreat or residency is really when you're applying to shows and competitions and that gives you a boost when you've been selected to be in a curated show and that feels so good and i i would like more of that <laughs> i would just like to have more connection with the outside world and and other artists and other artists yes what about your you just mentioned a residency and i know you had a resident you did a residency in france can you tell us a little bit about that i really love france i've been to france now 3 times almost 5 weeks at a time there's something about the french countryside that really inspires me as an artist both realistically painting and abstractly painting i think it's the the light in france is just beyond beautiful the filtering of the sun through the clouds, the beautiful lush green, the sunflowers, the lavender. It's just its own beautiful palette. And so I get very inspired there. So I was on Instagram. I post on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, you name it. And I noticed that there was a a new residency I hadn't seen before uh, was listed and I applied. It's called the Chateau Orquevo, O-R-Q-U-E-V-A-U-X. Is that, that's in France too? It's between Dijon and Champagne, west of Paris by about three hours. And it's the most beautiful place I've ever been to. And I was awarded a residency for two weeks a couple of years ago in June. And it was the most nourishing, nourishing experience I've ever had as an artist. I was with 13 or 10 other artists. We had dinner every night. We drank wine at night. We had tea and croissants in the morning. And we all disappeared for hours to do our work. And then we'd come back together. I actually cried at the first dinner. I was so happy to be there. Oh, I hope you have more and more of more experiences like that. I, I do. Are you applying to any residencies now? 
I have. I've applied to a residency in Italy, and I'm following up with that. And I've also applied to this prestigious com competition called the Luxembourg Art Prize. It's in Luxembourg, and they actually give you a huge amount, of, like 40,000 euros if you're in it, and they fly you there, and they put you up with the other artists that are in the, the residency, Great. in the actual show. And it's very prestigious, and a lot of uh, collectors and museums will take note of that of that competition and launch careers. So, so when is that? Uh, the de it's every year. Um, I've done it for the last two years, and they encourage you to continue because uh, they start to know your work more and more when they keep seeing it. Right. That's great. Oh, so I have to, I have to do it in eight days. <laughs> I have to reapply in eight days. Okay. So you've got stuff to do. Your abstract work is very gestural. I'm wondering, do you feel a connection to the energy in the world, a greater energy as you create? Especially in the last year. I mean, I have to say my practice hasn't changed as an artist, but the the weight of the world is very much uh, apparent in your psyche during this horrible time of COVID. There are days when I paint, I actually have to go back home and go to bed because the energy that is coming out of me is almost a cathartic purge. And I'm very tuned into the world around me as most creatives are. And I actually had to stop watching the news because it was crushing my soul to create. Mm -hmm. I felt that as long as I kept creating and, ke and kept beauty in my life, that there's a sort of like the um, Zen story of the pebble in a pond. Oh, what is that story? Uh, that when you throw a pebble in a pond or a lake and you watch the ripples, they go everywhere. They touch everything. They affect the entire area, the entire planet, really. Yeah. And so I kind of feel artists have almost a duty to continue creating because even though I may not come in contact with someone for a few days, that my work and my seeking of serenity for my own life has a resonating effect on people and the planet. So wonderful. So true. I mean, art is very emotional and can be cathartic and can be moving. And I mean, I certainly feel that way when I look at your paintings. Thank you. What are some other uh, bodies of work in your paintings besides the Cosmos series? I, I seem to have, I started a new series and I, I, I don't say I started a new series. Like I started a new series, a new series occurred <laughs> a couple new series during this time. Uh, the Cosmos series are very colorful series. And I felt like they were, um, almost reflections of the cosmos, the universe, the uh, interstellar, how vast and wide and seemingly unknowing we are of the universe. They were very colorful during the time when COVID first started. It seemed to raise my vibration to do them. Then I, I did a few pieces just using black and white and gray called the, um, the wisdom of the trees because here where I paint, I'm up on a deck overlooking all these live oak trees. Mm, nice. And that became a simpler series, more distilled down to almost a pointillistic uh, style. And then from that, I was really feeling the need to use the color blue. I don't know why, but I know I'm why. Getting back to when I was a kid, right. loving midnight blue. I'm come, I've come back to blue. And I'm doing a whole series called the Black and Blue series, which is almost integrating the two styles of painting that I've done in the last year, the Cosmos series and the pointillistic style of the wisdom of the tree seem to be combining into one series of work. I've got about 10 pieces now. So. Oh, that's awesome. It takes me on a journey. I sometimes just feel like I'm putting on a seatbelt and something else is leading me. It's not an intellectual, I'm going to do a black and white and blue painting. You know, It's, it's just, more emotional, instinctual. And yeah, I get, I just, I, I try to get out of the way more than anything else because when I get out of the way like get your mind out of the way yes. and because if you overthink anything it becomes overworked right true true and I think uh as much as I'm not a huge Rolling Stones fan I heard Keith Richards interviewed on KCRW by Chris Doritas and he said how do you come up with your your licks and your chords and he goes I just get out of the way I, oh, let I it love that me. 
So I feel the same way about, especially abstract painting. I just get out of the way. Beautiful. Is there a message or philosophy behind your work? Um, I'm always seeking beauty in a sometimes not beautiful world. Right. I mean, being a human being is a very complex, emotional, soul crushing sometimes, and then elating experience. I'm seeking a way of people when they look at my work to just sort of have everything dissolve and they just become in the moment with that piece, which is what I'm trying to do when I'm making it. I'm trying to dissolve, move out of the way. Lisa, this has been so awesome, so interesting and fun. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you talking with me and giving all of our listeners uh, a glimpse into your creative process. If anybody listening has any questions about Lisa's work, you can email me through the Art Dimensions website, which is artdimensionsonline.com. You can check out Lisa's website, which is gazarearts.com. I started a new Facebook group called Beyond the Palette, so be sure to join that. I did, yes. Oh, you did? Thank you. Okay, awesome. Well, I appreciate your time. And is there anything else you want everybody to know about you before we sign off? No, just thank you for being such a supporter of the arts and thank you for helping me succeed at what I do. It's wonderful. And this series that you're doing right now is wonderful because I get to listen to and meet artists that I would not meet. So this is serving a wonderful purpose for me on that level as well. Oh, that's great. That's so nice to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Whitney. All right. Have a good day, everyone, and happy creating. Happy creating.